Hi guys, and welcome to my first online tutorial for Nomen uh, on V-Ray. Uh, my name is Christopher Nichols. I've written uh, a few DVDs on the subject of V-Ray for, uh, for the Nomen workshop. And this is uh, my first online uh, mini tutorial that I'm doing. And this is mainly focused on a uh, very specialized section of V-Ray that's actually probably one of the most powerful uh, elements of V-Ray, and that's anti-aliasing. Uh, the main reason that uh, anti-aliasing is so powerful is the fact that it can basically control the entire quality of your scene uh, from anywhere from the uh, uh, the lighting to the GI to everything. So um, there's a lot of things we're going to uh, discuss and a lot of things we're going to miss, but because uh, this tutorial could actually go on for a very long time, could probably do a whole DVD on the subject, but I'm going to try to keep it uh, a little bit more to the point and talk you through uh, some of the different methods that are going on in anti-aliasing uh, and leave you with enough tools that you can experiment on your own and figure out um, uh, what are the best uh, settings for you to use. So before I start, I'm going to sort of uh, walk you through some of the basic elements of anti-aliasing in V-Ray and uh, what they mean, and uh, let's start with that. Okay, so let's talk us uh, through some of these uh, different uh, anti-aliasing methods. If you go to a render dialog and you go to what it does with those samples and how it would filter them down for a one a pixel basis. Um, so let's talk about slightly what those different samples are. You have uh, basically fixed, adaptive QMC, and subdivision. If we look at fixed, for example, uh, real quick, and we'll go through these in depth very shortly, um, fixed basically is divided in subdivision. You'll see subdivision 1, 2, 3, 4, whatever you want to do. But go from the minimum up to the maximum amount of subdivisions and until it reaches a subdivision, uh, until it reaches a certain color threshold uh, that it needs to. Uh, we'll go into more in depth of what that is in a second. And then we have our adaptive subdivision, which is slightly different. Uh, notice it doesn't say a subdivision here it says rate it's an adaptive subdivision and it is measured in rates there's a minimum rate and a maximum rate and again a color threshold here and you can also use a normal threshold outline etc but we're just mainly going to focus on rates here and notice that rates are different from subdivisions that are measured here okay so let's talk briefly what those subdivision methods are okay so let's talk about subdivision first uh, subdivision is actually fairly uh, fairly straightforward. Um, this you guys you guys may have recalled this from my first DVD for those of you that have it. Uh, this is sort of a refresher on that. Uh, this basically let's imagine that this is the size of one pixel. Uh, a subdivision of one means one pixel. So you're sending out one sample for one pixel on a one subdivision. Uh, subdivision of two fairly straightforward. You take your um, uh, your pixel and you divide it in two and two. So you divide it by two, that's actually four samples per pixel. Subdivision of three is three by three, which is nine samples per pixel. Subdivision of four is four by four, 16 samples per pixel. Pretty straightforward, but keep in mind every time you go up, you're actually going up by a square of that value, okay? Uh, next is rate, which is actually even more uh, uh, accelerated in the way that it subdivides pixels. So let's talk about uh, rate here. Uh, in rate, what we have is imagine that uh, this area here is one pixel. Okay, what you have when you do a rate of one, you actually subdivide your area into uh, a two. Okay, zero, a uh, or rate of zero is actually equivalent to a subdivision of one. And then a rate of one is a magnitude up, so it's two. Okay, and then a rate of two would actually take this and divide all of these by two, okay, which would be a subdivision of four. So a rate of two is equal to subdivision of four. So what would a rate of 3 be? It would be divide all of these again by another one, and that would be 8. So a, a rate of 3 is a subdivision of 8. Okay. The advantage of rate is you can actually do what's called an undersampling. So a subdivision or a rate of minus 1 is equals to actually 4 pixels. 
okay so you can actually have only one sample done for four pixels you can actually do what's called under sampling which is it's a kind of an advantage in certain times where you know that there are certain areas where not much is changing such as on a big blank wall or or situations like that very common in large architectural models etc you can under sample those areas and actually uh, go through the anti-aliasing very quickly so you can actually do less anti-aliasing etc and then of course an, uh, a minus two subdivision is one two three four five six seven eight by eight or so sixty four pixels are in a minus two rate okay so that gives you a basic overview of the difference between rate and subdivision which is an important part of the understanding when we're going through these exercises okay so now we had a, a little brief overview for some of you that might have been a refresher course if you'd already seen my DVD uh, but now we're going to talk about a um, well, let's do a brief introduction of this scene. The scene is fairly straightforward. I basically have these pebbles here. So that on the scene, I basically have a single light source. Uh, that light source is actually in a uh, dome light situation, okay, uh, with an HDR on it. Um, in the scene, I'm going to give you the HDR. I will not provide for you. You'll have to provide your own HDR and do your own experimentation. Uh, this is just one that I'm using for the scene, and you guys can experiment with any one you want. Um, with that said, uh, these basic uh, uh, pebbles have these specialty blend shaders on them to get a little more reflection, etc. And I'll talk about blend shaders at some other point. Um, but uh, they basically have some uh, some extreme noise on them. You'll see there's actually several levels of noise that have added to each one of these. If we look at the uh, breakdown of the shader uh, in the scene, you'll see that basically I have a lot of noise sort of breaking down for each pebble. And uh, I have a clear code of reflection. And then I have a grid that has a um, uh, reflection in it as well, uh, which has got a Fresnel reflection in it and uh, that reflection has a glossiness. Important things to note about this glossiness is it's got a subdivision of 8 and the, sub and the um, pebbles also have a subdivision of 8 on the glossiness and then there's this wall and the wall is basically a uh, just a gray wall that I'm using, sort of a 50% gray wall uh, and uh, there's no glossiness on that wall, it's a straight diffuse wall. Um, and then let's see what else is there. Okay, I have a subdivision of 16 on this light for the shadows, okay? Uh, this particular light actually has um, the HDR, which has a bright light source in it, and it will cast a, a sharp shadow because of the way that uh, V-Ray's dome lights work. So uh, uh, I have a subdivision of 16 on that shadow, and that's going to become a key factor in when we uh, go through this process. So uh, now you've got a brief introduction to this scene. Uh, now let's go forward and talk about uh, our basic uh, implementation of anti aliasing and how it affects the quality of our scene. Okay, so let's start with the most basic anti-aliasing method, which is fixed, okay? Um, and basic doesn't necessarily mean bad, which we will soon find out. Um, this subdivision of one means that basically it will shoot a ray out from the camera. Uh, from that ray, uh, several rays will go out and do different things for different methods. Uh, you will have rays that uh, measure the... Uh, 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 shadows, rays that measure the glossiness, etc. So uh, one ray could actually uh, sample itself several times in order to measure glossiness, can measure uh, 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 shadows, etc. And that is all designated by these different subdivisions for different areas. So you can control a subdivision for every little detail of thing of uh, of the image, uh, which is a good thing, but actually can be quite cumbersome at the same time. Uh, so what I've done in these in this particular tutorial is I have pre-rendered all of these images that I'm going to go through uh, just for the sake of uh, showing you uh, what's going on and give you render times. These render times are actually the critical part of this whole uh, aspect because it basically shows how the quality uh, changes versus the render time, which is the key factor to uh, rendering in a in a anti aliaser of this type, uh, is to try to get the maximum quality in the shortest amount of time. Um, now, that of course, uh, uh, time is relative to the speed of your computer, and for the sake of this argument, I just wanted to let you know that uh, I did all of these renderings, uh, and all these render times are based on the renderings done on my laptop. 
be honest. Uh, so the render times are actually much higher than you would have on a, on a regular workstation. Uh, my laptop is, uh, while fairly new, is uh, I use a Core 2 Duo um, uh, processor. Uh, it's got two gigs of RAM. Uh, the Core 2 Duo is at two gigahertz. Uh, so it's a fairly uh, fast processor for a laptop, but uh, um, on all of these render times, you should expect a uh, rendering time that is um, at least uh, twice as fast for a workstation that is uh, nor a normal workstation. Uh, if the um, or, or fairly new workstation, if you're using a brand new workstation such as the new uh, dual quad core processors, uh, you can expect render times to go. Uh, uh, be cut in probably a quarter of what they are right now. Um, again, let's just go through quickly some of the other settings that we have in the scene before we get started immediately. Uh, I do have uh, some GI going on. I have a QMC for the primary bounce and a light cache for the secondary bounce. The user, reason I'm using QMC and not a radiance map that most of the work I do is based on animation and so these type of anti-aliases work really well for animated scenes as opposed to radiance map which can be somewhat problematic for animated scenes with animated objects. Uh, so that's kind of my de facto method of working. Okay, so uh, let's get started with uh, the actual rendering. Okay, so we basically now uh, are gonna I'm gonna show you the pre-rendered scene that comes with this image, and it's basically uh, this right here. You'll notice obviously we have some serious uh, anti-aliasing problems uh, going on, uh, but overall. Uh, for example, if you look here, there's a, there's a there's a fine noise. There's definitely noise, but there's a fine noise in terms of what's happening in this wall. And the reason it's not a coarse noise is the fact that basically, uh, while the ray hit here, it was still able to bounce enough and collect enough samples in terms of the subdivisions of the um, uh, uh, of the uh, light source as well as subdivisions of the anti of the uh, glossy rays, etc. So all of these rays are up with sample. And the main problem we have is in the actual pure color map, which basically only has one subdivision. Okay, so uh, now let's take this uh, here and let's go ahead and subdivide it one more time. Nothing much has changed that, in that wall. That's because the subdivisions haven't really solved the problem of this wall. All they've really solved uh, or started to solve are the problems of the fine color areas. Uh, so uh, our render times are mainly dealing with this anti-aliasing problem. Okay, um, so go up again, and I, go, I like to go, let's go into factors of two, so we're going to go to four subdivisions and see how that affects our render times. At four subdivisions, you'll notice we're already a lot better. Now this, in terms of everything that's the way it's looking, uh, what's all of a sudden start to happen is that while this uh, surface starts to look a lot better, the noise on this wall starts to become more noticeable relative to all the other noises that's going on. That's because at four subdivisions, there you start to realize that there's not enough subdivisions on this wall to really take hold of it. Uh, so let's keep going and take it up to eight. And at eight subdivisions, um, our render times have gone way up at this point. And you notice that um, at eight subdivisions, this wall has started to become to look a lot better, um, and then in fact, our entire scene is a lot better. There is still noise here, absolutely some noise in these areas, uh, but in general, uh, we basically had to uh, almost triple our render time in order to uh, in order to get to, to that um, that level of quality. So we're at 18 minutes now in terms of render time at subdividing this by eight. Um, which is at 1825. Uh, and again, remember if we did this on a normal uh, uh, workstation, this would be about nine minutes for this type of render. Uh, which, considering there's GI and it's all image based lighting and uh, glossy rays, etc., isn't bad at all. But uh, nonetheless, uh, it's a big jump in render time. Again, let's take this up to 16. Okay, and at 16, what we'll do is see that basically now at 16 rays uh, we're at an hour which is a huge jump in time this is basically going up another by a factor of three again um, and but our red but our scene is pretty much noise free at this point you're not going to see any noise in here uh, at all 
uh, and our quality of our lines are just in, in immaculate and all of the uh, fine speckled dots on these pebbles are actually in perfect shape. But see what happens, uh, we are using a V-Ray camera so I'm going to select that V-Ray camera and I'm actually going to turn on uh, this depth of field effect here. The depth of field effect in normal, uh, if you uh, haven't been using uh, these uh, specialty methods of anti-aliasing, uh, will actually uh, substantially increase your render times. But let's see what it actually does in this particular instance. Um, I've now introduced depth of field, and you'll notice we go from an hour five to an hour seven. And you're wondering, how is that possible? How did it barely affect our render times to introduce a depth of field effect uh, in this method? The reason being that it already had plenty of samples to deal with all of these problems in the same way to deal with all the other problems in these zones. So uh, introducing a depth of field, if you sample enough samples in your anti-aliasing, introducing things such as depth of field, motion blur, etc., do not affect your image that much. So uh, the depth of field effect that's going on in our scene is actually uh, virtually trivial once your anti-aliasing gets at a very high factor. And this is an important thing to note as we go on with this. Uh, okay, now let's get on to a, another method of anti-aliasing, which would be uh, QMC. All right, uh, so now let's hop over to adaptive QMC. Uh, in adaptive QMC, what we're actually uh, doing is actually not just sort of brute force subdividing a pixel and getting lots of samples for that pixel. What we're actually doing is subdividing a pixel by a minimum amount and then if there is a lot of noise in within that pixel based on this noise number here which is called a color threshold uh, we go up a subdivision and if that's if it's still too noisy you go up another subdivision and another subdivision and another subdivision until it hits its maximum okay so that color threshold says how far do we go uh, until the noise is good enough and the maximum says that's the farthest you can go. Uh, okay, with that being said, uh, let's go ahead and just do 1-1 one, one at point 0.1 and see how that compares to fixed. And basically what you will see is in that rendering, uh, let's compare this to the first one uh, of fixed 1. And you'll see this is at a, a render time here of 2.49 and then at uh, 1, 1 is 205 and it looks almost identical in terms of its problem of what's going on. Uh, there may be a little slightly more noise in here which would account for the slightly uh, shorter rendering time but basically it's the same thing. 1, 1 would be equivalent to fixed 1. Um, but what I want to do is actually something a little more int uh, 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 interesting. Uh, we have a huge anti-aliasing noise problem in our fine color lines in terms of the grain that's going on here and in terms of the grain that's going on here but we don't have as much of a noise problem in terms of our um, uh, sub uh, our, our smoothness of our walls our glossy rays here, our shadows here, etc. The reason what I want to actually do is attack everything in one step. I don't want to have to adjust the subdivision of every single factor of the image. I want to attack it all in one and the reason being that I can be much more adaptive in terms of the way that I attack a problem by creating, uh, uh, by allowing everything to become a what I call a noise problem. So uh, adaptive QMC basically deals with everything as a noise problem if you do a few extra little steps in here. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to go into my um, random QMC sampler, okay, which is something that some people don't really use that much, but is actually very, very powerful. Um, one thing you'll notice that this normally defaults at 0.85, and I've actually made it one. I'm basically telling this the uh, the QMC uh, engine in V-Ray to be as adaptive as possible and then giving it a general color threshold of 0 .01, 0 0.01 but that doesn't really matter because really what matters is this value here which is the color threshold of the adaptive QMC image sampler and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at this value here 
And what this global subdivision multiplier is, is it takes all the subdivisions that are in things like, for example, the, um, the camera depth of field. I'm going to turn that off for now. Uh, the camera depth of field, the, uh, let's see, the subdivisions on the glossies, the, uh, let's see, what else, the shadows on the light. All of these are subdivided by a certain amount, and they have a multiplier of 1, so 1 times 16 is 16, etc., etc. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take this to 0 0.01, and that sort of multiplies everything down by a factor of 100. So, uh, since you can't have a subdivision lower than 1, it'll pretty much make everything uh, a subdivision of 1. Takes my light, makes it 1 uh, in terms of the shadows, takes this, makes it 1, everything is 1. So we have a subdivision generally of 1, which will make the image look pretty bad along this wall, noise in terms of the shadows, noise in terms of the subdivisions here, everything is 1 problem and that's going to be all dealt with in the anti-aliasing. Uh, this is a method that's introduced by Vlado, the, uh, one of the main authors of V-Ray, uh, and uh, in terms of what he calls the universal settings. And what I've done basically in this presentation is to present it in a way that actually makes it a lot more, uh, shall we say, useful because his values that he introduces can be a little daunting for people to try to use. So I've sort of adapted this his method of working into a way that I like to work is actually very useful for day to day and uh, but it's a very powerful thing so the first thing to notice is basically we go from two minutes 50 second render very fast render very noisy but an even noise across the entire image okay so now uh, let's take this uh, once we divide that to one let's just go ahead and start using more samples for inch and I'm going to go ahead and introduce Four to the maximum value here and see what that does. So now basically you'll see that we've kind of attacked our problem here and that we've gone and we've taken out a lot of noise. Now here's an important thing to notice and the best way for me to talk about it is actually to render this out and show you what it actually means. So I'm going to do a quick render and talk about it. But uh, basically look at the problem here the problem here is that now all of our noise exists in dark areas or there's more noise in dark areas than there is in bright areas and this dark area problem is kind of a, a weird thing and I'm going to talk about it in a second so first thing I need to do is I'm going to go ahead and render this and pause the video and talk about it in the render because that's the easiest way for me to explain to you guys okay so basically here's the render and the way I render, uh, as a lot of you should be rendering, is in linear space. So I keep all my data data linear, and I just use the V-Ray frame buffer to show me uh, what it actually looks like in correct monitor space. Uh, so let's look at this area here. And the way you do it in V-Ray is to display an sRGB color space uh, for, um, for the monitor. But if I turn that off, I'm actually looking at the raw uh, linear data through the monitor which is significantly darker but if you do that you'll notice that the noise problem is even throughout and the dark area to see noise through uh, in the same way that I do which is through my monitor so let me turn this off and show what happens uh, if I go into my color mapping and I have turned my gamma to a 2.2 which is approximately matching an sRGB color space. All right, I'm going to go ahead and do a render again. And what you'll notice is that basically the blacks now have uh, gone away in terms of the noise. They're not gone away, they've substantially reduced the noise, and that the noise pattern is kind of even across the entire image again. But this is linear data and it looks like it's sRGB corrected data which uh, for my monitor which is wrong because if I actually turn on sRGB now I've, it's way too bright so my data is incorrect uh, so what I need V-Ray to do is to see noise like this but keep the data so that I can still be able to use it in linear color space so how do I do that which is kind of a difficult thing well this is kind of a new thing to V-Ray uh, is there's this little function here which is extremely powerful and it allows you to uh, have V-Ray see everything 
in the color mapping uh, through whatever numbers you throw here, but not actually render them. And this includes the way it sees noise. So if I turn on Don't Affect Color Adaptation Only, so it'll only use uh, uh, this color mapping for the adaptive nature of V-Ray. You can set your gamma value here, but it won't actually render. So what does that actually look like uh, from here? It will look like this. Now, notice our render times have gone up because it's had to solve for more noise, but the noise is a lot more even. This is before the gamma correction. This is after, before and after. See, so all of our black problems have become less problems. Uh, nothing, I mean anything else by that statement, but basically all of the noise that we have in the black areas have uh, gotten a lot better uh, just by setting the gamma in that way. And now we're back to an even noise across the whole board here, which is good. So let's go to the next step. Okay, so basically what we need now is we need to basically have more samples in our scene because 4 is not going to cut it and we need to just go up in a value. So I'm going to go ahead and take this up to 4. Okay, when I do that, uh, basically we'll notice that here's uh, at, at 4, sorry, I'm going to take it up to 8 is what I meant to say. Uh, at 4, our value, it look, our image looks like this, and then I take it to 8, and look what happens. Uh, there is barely any difference at all between 4 and 8 and the render times have not gone up at all. Um, why is that? It's actually a very simple reason for that. Uh, this color threshold, it had already, it never goes up to 8. It just keeps going till about probably between 3 and 4, maybe goes up to 5 in some cases, and then cuts out. It says, good enough, no problem, don't need to add anymore. So basically, our color threshold is too high. We need to say, I want a finer threshold of color to sample to. So we're going to go ahead and cut this in half to 0.05 and see what happens to our image. Okay. So if I cut this down to 0.05, you'll see that, boom, now it cuts the noise in literally half and the render times go up uh, a little more than double okay so uh, that's kind of what's going on when you start to cut your noise threshold you can basically uh, adaptively go in there and, uh, uh, and and lower your the amount of noise through this noise threshold there's only so far you can go because this is a maximum subdivisions you have, right? So you can't really go much uh, lower than that. So let's go ahead and close this window. Um, so at uh, at 8.05, this is kind of what our image is looking at. Render times are still fairly good, okay? At 441, again, remember this is on my laptop. On a regular computer, this would be about uh, 2 minutes, 20 seconds or so. Okay, let's keep going. Let's go ahead and cut this down to 16 again, okay? 16. Go here. Again, we're dealing with the same problem as we were before. Too much noise threshold. Okay, uh, so we need to lower the noise, uh, the color threshold in our anti-aliaser again. So I'm going to go ahead and lower it to 0.02. Okay, uh, to a little, you know, more than half, uh, about two fifths of what it was. Okay, uh, what does that do? Okay we're now way better in terms of our noise. And notice another thing that starts to happen. You start to see this gets crippled, this gets sharper, everything else, all this noise goes away. But little things that are important is that the reason I chose these pebbles is they have a lot of very fine little speckles to them. And then if you don't sample them enough, uh, they basically um, lose that speckle. You don't get them. They kind of get averaged out of the scene. So uh, we, I'm going to basically look at this image and say, OK, that's fine, but there's still a slight amount of noise in here. And I want to lower that a little bit more. OK, 14 minutes, we're in good shape. Remember what we had before has gotten just slightly better. OK, our render times have gone up by about uh, double the render times. OK, so all this has happened. now. Uh, but this is a very fine image, uh, and it's half an hour, so it's half the time that it was at fixed of the same value. 
okay? Uh, because it adaptively doesn't need to go that high, which is a good thing. Now this is also, keep in mind, this is a real, uh, so let's do what we did last time and go ahead and turn on the depth of field and you'll notice that when I turn on depth of field, uh, again, we're not affecting our render times that much uh, because it basically can, it already has been sampling these a great deal and it wasn't that much more of an effort to get you the, uh, the depth that you needed for your depth of field. And now you get basically a depth of field effect at 30 minutes on my laptop for a scene like this, which is actually fairly good render time. Uh, and if you would do this on a, on a new computer, on a, on a, on a, on a uh, fairly new workstation, you could expect to get a rendering like this in about 15 minutes. Uh, this is at video res, a D1 res. Uh, and if you had a brand new one with a quad core, you'd probably get this down to about seven minutes, I would guess, uh, which is a really good uh, rendering time uh, considering all the amount of glossy rays and anti aliasing and GI. Vision of eight. So it's going from two pixels to a subdivision of eight pixels. Uh, actually, sorry, four, four entire pixels to subdividing a single pixel into eight pixels. Um, and with a color threshold of 0.1. And let's see what that actually gives us in this scene. Uh, I am actually going to go in here and turn that back on to 1 because it doesn't make any sense to do that for adaptive subdivision in the same way that it does for uh, QMC. But uh, let's go ahead and see what that does. Uh, now, you'll notice a few things. And this happens a lot uh, to people, so it's a good place to pay attention. One, um, this wall, uh, the render times are actually uh, pretty long uh, for this scene. Um, the 7 minute 31, which is uh, halfway between when we did a maximum of 8, and why is that? The reason being that it probably undersampled a pixel here and skipped this entire pixel of what this line could be, because it just skipped it. Uh, because uh, adaptive subdivision will undersample a great deal, which is great for surfaces like this, but bad for surfaces like this, and bad for surfaces like this. You'll notice these huge gaps of noise, uh, and just trying to smooth this rock without creating any of the speckles uh, in these areas. So uh, adaptive subdivision can actually undersample quite a bit. Let's actually look at what that is. I'm going to do a quick render here. I never actually did this rendering. I'm just going to show you off the bat. If I take my min rate to minus one, minus one, uh, look at what it actually does. I'm going to go ahead and pause the render. So what you'll notice is that the undersampling kind of ignores a lot of areas here. Kind of creates this dot, and you notice it doesn't break it up. The world zero is a subdivision of one, and two is a subdivision of eight. So it was a two one point one. Okay, so um, we're at two one point one, and then here we'll notice that we've started to regain some of our uh, lines in this area, but what we've really gained a lot of is um, our noise on our pebbles. Okay, so different areas have different types of gain. Our wall has virtually unchanged from this whole experience. Okay, uh, mainly we're dealing with the fine areas. Okay, so the advantage of the subdivision is that large smooth surfaces come to correct values much quicker, but small detail areas have serious problems when you're dealing with that serious problem. They have problems when dealing with uh, adaptive subdivision in terms of the anti-aliasing. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and uh, render this at this rate, and I'm going to uh, unpause it to show you what's going on with the RAM. Actually, I'm going to go ahead and just show you what's going on with the RAM, so um, why don't we just do this? We'll just uh, ring up the task manager and uh, ignore the rendering time. Notice we're at about a gig of RAM right now. Uh, that's I have a lot of things loaded, so it's really not all max that's using the RAM. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and hit render here and uh, see what happens to the RAM as we start to go up in our render time. Okay, um, when we were uh, when we use adaptive uh, subdivision for our anti um uh, our um, the uh, maximum value actually ends up affecting our RAM. And uh, I'm not going to go too much in depth to us into this, but uh, suffice it to say that you have to be very careful how high you set your maximum value because your RAM will go up. Uh, as opposed to QMC, 
notice it was 0.03 after it's done the light cache um, and then now it'll start to render um, actually I think I have subdivision uh, depth of field on so I'm going to go ahead and turn that off uh, it'll render uh, let's do that one more time sorry as I talk through this problem um, notice it'll start to uh, uh, the render times will uh, uh, th the RAM will go up slightly once it starts the anti-aliasing anti process. Uh, won't go up much in this specific case because my rate is at two. Okay, I'm actually not going to. I'm going to almost ignore this this um, this image. I don't want you to actually look at the image. I want you to look at what's going on in the RAM as the max rate goes up. Okay. Um, okay. Now it started the rendering process right here. And you notice the RAM has gone up slightly as it starts to actually do the rendering. Okay. Hasn't gone up much, but it has gone up. Okay. Uh, now I'm going to go ahead and cancel this, and I'm going to take this value to three. Okay. And see what happens to rendering time. Starting the light cache. Preparing the lights. It's a big light source. Now it's building a light cache. So before it did the light cache, that's 0.03, which is where we were before. As it's starting to render, the RAM will start to go up a little bit. Okay, it's climbing, it's climbing. Okay, it's gone up about 60 megs or so. Okay, and it will stay at that method, at that rate, as it's actually going through this render process. Okay, uh, this is dependent on your bucket size mainly. And let's see the, the subdivisions here. 0.06. Okay. Now let's take it up to 4. through its light building, light cache, and we'll notice what happens to the RAM as we go through this process. Okay, it's actually not that bad. Let's see what happens when you actually go in here and subdivide that, lower the color threshold on that. We'll go through to what that actually does in the image in a second. I just want you guys to see what happens with the RAM. I've often, basically what I'm getting down to, the fact is this, is when I start to really pump up the settings of the adaptive subdivision and lower the color threshold, I've run out of RAM and crashed max, even at um, just a video res, because it pumps so many samples into the image. And it operates basically very differently because it kind of keeps everything in memory as it has all these samples in there. So you notice our RAM just keeps going up. If you do this in uh, QMC mode, your RAM would not actually go up. Uh, it would stay the same. And this is just going to keep going up until basically um, V-Ray will crash, uh, which is not a good thing because it basically has to keep everything in memory as it's going through there. Uh, it's just adding more and more samples as it's going through there, trying to find the best color threshold, and you're going to eventually run out of RAM. Uh, not a good thing. Uh, so. Something to keep in mind, when you're using adaptive subdivision, if you use adaptive subdivision, I actually don't even use it anymore, be very careful when you start to really pump up these settings because your RAM will actually just become a problem. And this will not be the case 
you use QMC. Uh, okay, so instead of letting Max crash, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, cancel this process uh, because it'll actually crash it and go back to where we were. And that was at 0, 2, and 1, 1. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and uh, take the rate to 3 and see what happens. So we're at 0, 2, uh, 0.1, and now we go to 3, and you notice that our lines are starting to fill in a little bit better, but obviously it's still nothing compared to what we would have before, but generally speaking, we're a lot better. Again, we're at 10 minutes, so we're already almost reaching what we were in terms of the, the better quality image when we're using QMC, but it's still having a lot of problems with these little fine lines in this area. Um, so what do we have to go from here? I'm not going to go to 4, so I'm actually going to lower the color threshold. Um, and I'm going to lower that to uh, 0.05, some of the method that we did before. And what does that look like? 0.05, notice that literally these little dots that didn't weren't there start to appear, and our lines are starting to fill in a little bit more. Okay doubled our render time to do that. We're now at 22 minutes, uh, so but it's looking a lot better. Again, like I said, this wall is almost perfect, but we still have problems here, still have problems there, these lines aren't filled in, uh, generally speaking. So certain things get really well addressed with adaptive uh, or, or adaptive subdivision, uh, and certain things do not. Okay, so uh, what's the next step? As you know, I don't necessarily want to go too crazy on these values, on the, especially on the max value, because I know that uh, it will actually create a problem in terms of my RAM. So my only bet is I can lower the color threshold. So I'm going to lower that to 0.02 and see what that gets us. Uh, and that gives us an, uh, an hour and six minutes. At this point, this is in really good shape. But I still have a little bit of problems here. In fact, the Fix 16, which took just as long, had a depth of field effect. Uh, to this image. And what you'll notice is that when I do that, depth of field comes in, etc. My render times double. Okay, so we're now at 2 hours and 18 minutes to add an effect like depth of field. And this is just an increasing problem for the whole process because uh, basically um, adaptive subdivision just does not work well with glossy effects, glossy rays, glossy shadows, glossy uh, things in general does not work as well with it. It works really well with, with, with plain white diffuse surfaces which is great for architectural surfaces but not for um, glossy effects. So um, hopefully with this you guys have gotten a good idea of, of what's going on in terms of um, anti-aliasers and uh, let me just give you a brief rundown of what I use and I by far do not consider this the way that you need to set things but I'm just gonna go ahead and run down okay now that you know this this is what I like to use and you be sure to use whatever method you want to do and I would encourage you to experiment with anti-aliasing you'll have this scene and keeping the global subdivisions to one uh, setting your um, let's take your light for example the light shadows on your lights to a, a good value 16 in this case but it could be 8 or whatever uh, setting everything to kind of a standard value uh, uh, is good and that gives you the power to uh, get whatever you need in terms of a basic look I can check lighting I can check basic things all the time uh, if I need to check get a little bit better uh, I like to take this to two, and that gives me a little bit better preview if I'm doing a motion blur or I'm doing a depth of field, etc. Just gives me a little bit more of an idea of what that is. It's not going to be the final quality. This is just for fast and quick and dirty kind of looks of things. Uh, they generally work really, really well. Okay, so that's my uh, my default values that I use for just checking out things and seeing if uh, you know my rendering is, is happening. Now when I start to get to the final quality image I'm always going to probably pick adaptive, uh, adaptive QMC in most cases and I will usually start uh, at my high quality is usually going to be right around here to be honest. Uh, 
this particular image was a little bit different in general cases, this particular scene, uh, we start to get into good enough quality at around 8. Uh, generally speaking, I find it the good, good enough quality for me, and again, it will be different for you to experiment in your own scenes, is going to be at 16. So 1, 16, 0.01. And then also keep in mind that I like to turn that down to 0.1. Actually, at this point, um, because the maximum value is 16, changing that to 0.1 uh, or 0.01 uh, doesn't really make a difference because it's not it, it's already sampling enough samples here to take care of any problems here. So it's really not going to make a big difference. It'll only really make a difference if this was like at 4 or 1 or anything like that. So it doesn't really make a difference. I actually don't even touch this. I like to, what I do is I make sure that my depth amount is about 1, which is going to be a good good thing for me. So um, with that is basically where I start. Okay, When I have extremely bright areas, which we have a few in here, like this, okay, uh, it's not really affecting my scene that much. But sometimes when there's a high uh, uh, or with a low glossiness and the really broad speculars, get an extremely bright areas, get these little speckly dots that happen from specular highlights. Uh, there's several ways to solve that, but basically what you need to do is start to think about lowering some of these uh, uh, or getting even higher quality. And I've gone uh, in several scenes, I've started my default at 125.05, and that can pretty much give me most of what I need. Again, this scene took a long time to render, and I didn't need to go at this level of quality. But in some scenes, you'll notice that 125.05 will actually render fairly quickly um, and never be that much of a problem. Okay, so uh, what, we'll, what I've also noticed is that if there's certain very difficult situations where just highlights are just sparkling like crazy, etc., I may need to go up to 50, if not 80. Okay? but very, very, very rarely. I would say that this value here would probably get you 90% there. You may need to go lower than that, 0.02, uh, 0.01, etc. which I think is basically what we wind up in this scene, right? Sorry, I can't remember. But anyway, uh, this values uh, will probably get you where you need to be. 90-95% of the way, and you may need to go to 95, that's going to be like 99% of the time, in a, or 99.9% .9 of the time, really. Very rarely do you have to go above uh, this level of quality for your scene. Uh, that is my basic understanding, or my basic feeling of the situation. Again, I would encourage you to find your own, um, and go from there. So, uh, with that said, I really encourage you guys to look into uh, uh, this specific scene, to play with different settings if you want as well as uh, look into your own scenes and try these different methodologies and see what best suits your needs because your, ne your needs may not involve as much a need for glossy rays and QMC and you may find that uh, adaptive subdivision is a better method for you. I would just encourage you to keep in mind that the method that I outlined can actually be extremely powerful and get your results very, very quickly and allow you to throw in things like at, uh, depth of field and motion blur and uh, uh, glossy rays, etc., much faster without having to worry about the quality at that point. So, with that said, hopefully, you guys can um, uh, look into this. Uh, all the scene files should be in there, minus a certain texture and the HDR files, etc. But uh, you can use, definitely use your own HDRs or, or just use whatever lighting you would like to use. Uh, but the scene is really sort of made for an HDR dome light scenario. Uh, and then uh, experiment with it and uh, have fun. And uh, hopefully you'll be able to uh, raise the quality of your images and your renderings as well. Thank you.